Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Akunzire, presenting Optimal Utilization of Prevention of Mother-to-Child Transmission, PMTCT, of HIV Services and Associated Factors Among Adolescent Mothers under Group versus Focused Antenatal Care in Busoga Region, Eastern Uganda. Yeah, so we defined optimal utilization of PMTCT services as having attended antenatal care and received HIV counseling and testing at any point during the pregnancy but before the third trimester. If the mother was found HIV negative, subsequent retesting for her in the third trimester at birth until six weeks after or within three months of the last test. If the mother was found po positive and retroviral therapy for her under option B+, and for the infant, safe delivery, safe feeding, early infant diagnosis, which entailed DNA PCR within six to eight weeks, nivirapine syrup for the first six weeks, and then cotrimoxazole till the status was confirmed. If the infant turned positive at any stage, they were uh, referred into care. Um, So um, uh, in Uganda, uh, roughly one in four adolescents get pregnant by the age of 20. Busoga region had the highest birth rate contributing 21% of all adolescent pregnancies in Uganda. Uh, in addition, two of every three new infections are among adolescent girls. This signals a high HIV incidence among adolescents. Um, Busoga region had the highest HIV prevalence. Uh, it was among the top five regions with a high HIV burden. Um, optimal utilization of PMTCT services is crucial for the elimination of MTCT because it reduces the risk from 15 to 45% to less than 5%. Antenatal care is crucial for PMTCT utilization as it serves as an entry point um, for delivery of the PMTCT services. However, there was 30% optimal PMTCT utilization in a study in central Uganda under focused antenatal care among adolescent uh, mothers. These mothers face unique challenges in the utilization of these services. For instance, in addition to HIV-related stigma, they face stigma related to being uh, pregnant while they are young uh, adolescents. In addition, uh, since they are more likely to be first-time mothers, they have reduced self-efficacy uh, and also poor health literacy, among others. Um, so, um, in contrast to focused antenatal care, which, which offers individualized health assessment and timed antenatal care visits according to the need of the mother, um, group antenatal care a group's mother is a differentiated service delivery model and it's client-led and it groups mothers by maternal, gestational, age, as well as the HIV status. And it is usually facilitated by a healthcare worker. So it integrates individualized health assessment um, with health education that's usually done in groups. Other group activities that are done by the mothers like uh, blood pressure reading, taking height, height and weight, as well as peer peer-to-peer -peer support. Group antenatal care has shown improved health literacy and antenatal care adherence. Although it has been shown to be act uh, acceptable, studies on its efficiency, as well as factors associated with the utilization of these services among adolescents are scarce. So the objectives of uh, our study were to compare the optimal utilization of PMTCT of HIV services among adolescent mothers under group versus focused antenatal care in Busoga region, Eastern Uganda, as well as to determine the, the factors associated with the utilization. So uh, we, we used a comparative cross-sectional study. We enrolled adolescent mothers 10 to 19 years, both are HIV positive and negative, attending immunization and postnatal clinics at four facilities, that is two hospitals and two health center fours that were available from February to April 2020 and attended either mode of antenatal care. And they should have given written informed consent, completed at least 18 months of care if HIV positive and nine months of care if HIV negative. 
and they should have had infants aged nine months or less. Um, we excluded mothers who could not withstand the study procedures. And the information they gave us about utilization of these services was cross-referenced with that um, in, the, in the NC cards and registers. So um, we used um, the formula of sample size estimation for two proportions, and we estimated 528 participants. Uh, we used multi-stage sampling, that is, we conveniently sampled uh, health facilities in Busoga region that were closest to uh, Kampala for logistical reasons, and then we used proportionate sampling to obtain the number from each health facility, and then con consecutive sampling for the numbers within each health facility. So outcome variable is optimal utilization of PMTCT services, and our main exposure was the mode of antenatal care, that is with a group of focused antenatal care. However, we also looked at other variables like marital status, age, education, employment, parity, religion, number of ANC visits, whether the partner was tested and trimester of first ANC. So we used statistical methods to assess for the relationship between the outcome variable and the exposures, as well as to compare utilization of these services uh, between the two modes of antenatal care. So the results. So um, from the table of participant characteristics, uh, descriptively, uh, group, um, mothers under group antenatal care had earlier and more antenatal care visits. So this is a graph comparing mothers under group to those under focused antenatal care for optimal PMTCT utilization. On the y-axis is the percentage mean optimal PMTCT utilization, and on the x-axis is the mode of antenatal care. So as you can see, there was a higher mean proportion of mothers under group antenatal care that had optimally utilized these services, that is 74.7% compared to 41.2% under focused antenatal care. It is, however, important to note that uh, the utilization under both modes of antenatal care is low compared to the national um, target of 90% EMTCT retention. Uh, for the factors associated, we found that mothers under group antenatal care were 8% more likely to have optimally utilized these services compared to those under focused antenatal care. Uh, mothers, adolescent mothers that had a partner that tested for HIV were also 8% more likely to have optimally utilized these services compared to those that, uh, whose partner had not tested or those that didn't know the testing status. Um, mothers that had a first antenatal care visit in the second and third trimester were 7% and 28% respectively less likely to have optimally utilized these services compared to those that had attended their first ANC in uh, the first trimester. And finally, um, mothers that attended uh, Health Center 4, Bugembe Health Center 4 and Ginger Regional Referral Hospitals, that is uh, our study sites, um, were 13% uh, more likely and 15% less likely respectively to have optimally utilized these services compared to those from Iganga Hospital. So um, mothers, there was a higher mean optimal PMTCT utilization for mothers under group antenatal care. According to a before and after implementation study of group antenatal care, uh, in, in Rwanda, there was improved client satisfaction due to better relationship between healthcare workers and mothers, as well as between mothers. Um, utilization, as noted, under group antenatal care was low compared to the national target of 90% EMTCT retention. However, it is a positive step towards the global health sector strategy of EMTCT by 2030. So um, adolescent mothers that had earlier ANC had better um, optimal PMTCT utilization. According to the WHO recommendations on a positive pregnancy experience, earlier ANC means earlier education, detection, and management of ANC. According to a study in Nigeria, knowledge of the PMTCT cascade is a, is a, was associated with a better utilization of these services. So mothers at higher level facilities had lower PMTCT utilization. Um, according to, to a study in southwestern Uganda, healthcare workers re reported difficulty in follow-up um, with, uh, with higher level health facilities due to large catchment areas which are associated with them. 
There was also a higher optimal PMTC utilization among adolescents whose partners had tested for HIV. According to the WHO, male partner attendance of HIV counseling and testing uh, is one of the criteria used to measure male partner involvement. And this has shown a better utilization of these services uh, in a couple of settings in Africa, for example, Burkina Faso and Uganda. So the limitations of this study are that it was health center based and therefore limiting uh, the results to older adolescents with good health seeking behavior. However, uh, we believe that they can be uh, generalized to older adolescents uh, in healthcare settings. The efficiency of group antenatal care would have been best measured by using a randomized control trial. And then we had a small number of clusters, but we used statistical methods to cater for this. So in conclusion, having attended group antenatal care, a partner that tested for HIV, earlier trimester of first ANC and lower level health facility were associated with better utilization of these services. Um, so um, the, implica the implications of this study are that um, we, uh, the findings support wider implementation of uh, group antenatal care by Ministry of Health, especially among adolescent mothers. Then the Ministry of Health should sensitize communities about earlier antenatal care attendance, or perhaps co use community health workers or peers to enable, to enable this. And then future researchers should consider use of qualitative uh, research to understand what models best work for adolescent girls or models uh, that include adolescent boys. Yeah. I acknowledge the following. Thank you. Woo Clap hands for L. Thank you so much, my expect Rebecca. I will not add or subtract. Non talk also over to you. And I'm going to challenge you. Can you do it in subtract one minute from your time? <laughs> it's a challenge. It is a challenge, I accept it, if I can get the clicker working. Awesome, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'll be picking up a conversation around intimate partner violence and really focusing on how adolescent mothers are at risk more of experiencing intimate partner violence. When we think about COVID-19, we kind of all say things were bad, COVID-19 just made things worse, right? And this, and this presentation will just be highlighting what happened for IPV among mothers who were living with HIV compared to those who were not living with HIV. We measured IPV using the WHO scale, which basically compromises of 13 items, six looking at psychological IPV, eight looking at physical IPV, and three looking at sexual violence. There were three questions that we really wanted to ask. Was the proportion of adolescents experiencing IPV increasing due to COVID-19? And was this increase happening equally for those who are living with HIV compared to those who are not living with HIV? And so we used data from a study called the Hey Baby, which had baseline in the year 2018 and 2019, recruiting 1,046 uh, 1, adolescent mothers who had a mean age of 18 and had at least one live birth at that time. 30% of those women were living with HIV. COVID happened and then we had to follow them up remotely. So between 2021 and just maybe two months ago, we ended the follow up. And I'm using data right now for 67% of the cohort. There's not much difference between those included versus those who are not included, but the people who are living with HIV are now 35% for the follow up um, analysis. And so what do we see? During COVID-19, one in five of our adolescent mothers experienced IPV in the last 12 months. So this is either psychological, physical, or sexual. The rates of psychological, so like humiliation, saying something bad to you, were the same as physical, being insulted, shoved, beaten, um, as well as threatened. Sexual IPV, so being asked to have sex when you didn't want to, or feeling you could not say no, or actual forced penetration, was 4%. One in 10 is really important thing to note, had more than one form of intimate partner violence subjection in the last 12 months during COVID-19. We then said, how do these rates actually compare to before COVID-19? So before COVID-19 is shown in the dark black, well, black 
um, color, and then the gray shows during COVID-19. And what we can see for all these three types, psychological, physical, and sexual, there is an increase. There is an increase as well for any, which is at least one form of IPV, as well as for poorly, more than one form of IPV. So throughout, we see an increase during COVID-19. We then take a step back and say, well, let's look at the COVID-19 rates and say, do they differ by HIV status? Those in orange are though are adolescent mothers who are not living with HIV. Those in blue are adolescent mothers who are living with HIV. And we can see the blue tends to be higher than the orange, an indication that those who are living with HIV are more vulnerable to intimate partner violence, specifically psychological and physical intimate partner violence, and then any as well as multiple forms of intimate partner violence. Then we said, fine, there is an increase. Is this increase happening the same? So if there's a 5% increase in sexual violence, is the 5% increase for those who are living with HIV also a 5% increase for those who are not living with HIV? Same thing, is this 5% increase happening among adolescents who are still teenagers at follow-up? Is it also happening for those who are now older, between 20 to 25 years of age? So what we want to see for psychological, those who are living with HIV are still in orange. They had a 7% increase, and then those who are not living with HIV have a 4% increase. So somewhat the, the same. When we look for physical, however, it's quite different. There's a big difference in the proportion of increment in terms of physical IPV. Among adolescent mothers living with HIV, 17% increase since COVID-19 compared to 11% increase among those who are not living with HIV. Sexual violence, the increase was the same, ranging two to 4%. And then when we look at early, there's a 4% difference in the increase. And for poly, it's the same. So again, we see that adolescent mothers living with HIV were at risk at the beginning. COVID-19 increased rates, but it increased rates more for adolescent mothers who are living with HIV, specifically physical intimate partner violence. Then we said what happens with age. We saw for psychological IPV, something we're still trying to understand, that those who were between still teenagers, there was an increase of 10%. But for those who had become young adults, sorry, that should be 20 to 25, there was a decrease of 4% in terms of physical, psychological intimate partner violence. The increase in physical IPV due to COVID-19 was the same. Sexual violence, the same. And then for any, we see that teen mothers at follow-up had a 10% increase in any IPV compared to 8%, but still the same. So what we're seeing here, sorry, what we're seeing here is that actually when it comes to age groups, the only difference we're seeing is in psychological intimate partner violence with caution, but overall, despite of age, adolescent mothers still experience the same amount of increment in IPV due to COVID-19. So what were the stressors that COVID-19 really picked on? It had to do with the household. Among those individuals who had a change on who was living in the house, as well as there was an increase in conflict in the house, were more likely to report subjection to intimate partner violence. Those who did not know the HIV status of their partner also were more likely to experience IPV, in addition to being in an age-desperate relationship, so having a partner who was five years older than the adolescent mother. Food security, as well known, still came out as a very strong um, predictor of experiencing COVID-19 um, later on. So what should we do given this huge population we're expecting by 2050? We need to encourage screening of IPV in all our services, speed, HIV prevention, or care. We need to promote positive relationships that speak about intimate partner violence and we're able to solve problems or conflict in a non-violent manner. And we need to focus on how we can encourage and support food securities within all our contexts. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over quickly, quickly um, to 
Ms. Yanke Tome, who is from just here. So home ground advantage. Over to you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Very excited to be here. Um, as she just said, I'm Yanke, and I'm very lucky to work with the Adolescent Accelerators Hub, which is based at the University of Cape Town. And I'm here to present on behalf of a big team, um, but specifically my colleague, Catherine Roberts, who is leading this analysis, um, but she's currently in the UK. Um, and if you see a trend here, this is because um, this is another part of the Hey Baby work that my colleague Nanta Koza has just introduced. Um, but this specific analysis is focusing on uh, mental health among adolescent mothers living with and affected by HIV in South Africa, the effect of COVID-19. And so even before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, adolescent girls and young women in South Africa were already experiencing multiple mental health stresses. Um, and for young mothers, in addition to their daily socioeconomic stresses, um, especially those affected by HIV, they face a unique set of challenges that make them even more vulnerable to mental ill health. And this is important to the HIV response, um, as research has shown that mental health impairments um, increase the risk of HIV acquisition and negative health outcomes among adolescents living with HIV at every step of the HIV, HIV care cascade. Um, and in a review recently by our study PI, Professor Lucy Kluver, um, it was highlighted how poor mental health could be linked to increased risky sexual behaviors, decrease antiretroviral adherence, faster HIV disease progression, and also impaired prevention of mother to child transmission and effects on child development. And so, um, previous analysis from this cohort of young mothers found that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, young mothers living with HIV um, had significantly higher rates of poor mental health than mothers not living with HIV. And that brought us to our main research question uh, for this analysis, which is, did the COVID-19 pandemic have an effect on the mental health of adolescent mothers? And did this differ by HIV status? And so to answer this question, um, we use data from the Hey Baby Longitudinal Cohort Study, which was just mentioned by Nantakozo in the previous presentation. And this is the same cohort of 1,045 young mothers um, residing in the Eastern Cape province in South Africa, um, of which this analysis uses data from 704 of them, who now have an average age of about 22 years, and 30% of whom are living with HIV, so almost one in three. Um, the longitudinal nature and the timing of this data collection allows us to compare differences over time. And since our baseline data collection happened between 2018 and 19, this was obviously pre-COVID, um, and our follow-up round happened between 2020 and this year, um, which is post the onset of, of the COVID pandemic, and throughout kind of the thick of the national lockdown restrictions. Um, and then to measure mental health, we used four validated mental health scales that were self-reported. And for the purpose of this analysis, um, we define common mental disorder as scoring above a predetermined cutoff um, on any of the four scales, which were depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and suicidality. And now in looking at some descriptive findings of the current mental health of this cohort, so post COVID-19 onset, we find that overall half of the mothers now reported having any mental disorder. And this was marginally higher amongst mothers living with HIV at 55%. And this number is mainly um, driven by depression and anxiety, as we can see that 28% um, and 24% reported having depression and anxiety symptoms respectively. <laughs> 12% um, had suicidal thoughts or actions, and 6% experienced PTSD symptoms. And when comparing um, participants scoring above the cutoff for mental health symptoms pre and post COVID onset, we found significant increases in poor mental health um, on all measures of mental health symptomology. And this includes comorbid mental health conditions, um, which is having symptoms of two or more at the same, two or more types at the same time. And to focus your attention on the dark pink line at the top, um, you can see that the share of participants who reported having any common mental disorder um, rose from 13% before the pandemic to almost 50% um, after the pandemic onset. Um, and to look at these changes in more detail and to kind of better quantify resilient mental health, um, in other words, having good mental health even during the pandemic, uh, we split this cohort into four groups. Um, those with no common mental disorder, at both time points, um, those with chronic poor mental health, B, 
before and during the, the pandemic. Um, and then those who had improved symptoms, so those who had um, no common mental disorder before the pandemic, or sorry, had common mental disorder before and it somehow improved during the pandemic, and then finally deteriorating common mental disorder. Um, so having no common mental disorder before the pandemic, but reported having newly poor mental health after the pandemic had started. And the results showed us that for a large proportion of mothers, around 40%, um, who reported poor mental health during the pandemic, this was a new issue. Um, with smaller proportions having either chronic poor mental health or improved mental health, which was around 5%. And something important to note here is that although there is somewhat of a trend um, of adolescents living with HIV having worse outcomes, we did not find a statistically significant difference by HIV status for any of these measures. And then finally, um, with these four different groups in mind, we wanted to determine which sample characteristics were associated uh, with constant good or improved mental health. And so which factors had a protective effect on the mental health of these young mothers? And two of them came out um, as significant. Firstly, food security. And secondly, having no experience of abuse or violence, whether it be at the personal, household, or community level. And so to summarize, um, globally, this is the largest longitudinal exploration of mental health among adolescent mothers that we know of, including young mothers living with HIV. Um, however, important to note that this is still an exploratory analysis and um, analyses are still ongoing and we're happy to hear any of your ideas. Um, but when looking at our data from our mothers over time, we found a significant deterioration in mental health during the pandemic across all measurements. Um, we also find that provisionally the two factors that are most strongly associated with resilient mental health is food security and no experiences of violence or abuse. And so with this in mind, what can be done to help adolescent girls and young women, and especially young mothers? <coughs> Since we find that there is now a larger number of young mothers struggling with mental ill health, we need to make sure that we identify them effectively um, by strengthening mental health screening, linkages to care, and referrals to relevant services. We might think that the worst of the pandemic is now over, um, but it's important to remember that the effects thereof extend wider still, for example, um, in decreased antiretroviral adherence and also delays in child development. Further, food security and um, violence prevention seem to have a protective effect on maintaining good mental health, even during a pandemic. Um, and so to reiterate um, that we should continue to offer our, our efforts to maintain these, especially in times of emergencies or crises. And then finally, having good policies don't mean that much when they're not Im implemented in the real world. And so we need to ensure that we implement adolescent responsive services um, to mitigate the worst impacts of um, poor mental health, not only for mothers, but also for their children. And then just thank you um, to all of the collaborators, the amazing data collection team, and all of our funders. Thank you, thank you very much. So we're gonna take a quick round of questions. A quick, let me emphasize, quick. First come, first serve. So there is one over there. Miss, there is one over there, and then two. Oh three. my gosh, there is two there, and then I'm looking for hands that. Let's do five. Okay, three, four, and then yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I actually wanted to, sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a lack. Um, I actually wanted to check on the second presentation. Did on your sampling did you choose um, HIV positive or living with HIV that have disclosed, especially when it comes to the intimate partner violence? Uh, I just want to check the issues around disclosure. You are noting down, right? <laughs> Thank you. My question is to Nontokozo. Um, uh, my name is Sunet Pino. I'm from UNICEF. I see that you haven't included economic intimate partner violence, and I think that might have been really interesting 
if you think it how it relates to COVID-19 and how earnings might have been taken from these young girls during this economic crisis. So perhaps just your comments and your ideas around that. Thank you. Three and then it's four, yes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dumiso Matubela. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, my question is for just the last two speakers, particularly on the screening part, um, both for um, the mental health, um, given the challenges and barriers around that, with the language, um, and then with the IPV, um, in terms of how do we do the screening without uh, re-traumatizing our beneficiaries? Short and sweet. Thank you. And oh, the last hand. Oh, discriminated. And, uh, um, thank you so much. My question goes to the last speaker. Um, you spoke of strengthening um, linkages. My question is, do you have any recommendation how we can strengthen our linkages, because I've seen a point where a client has been referred to point A, from point A to B, B to C, up to Z, and still <laughs> none of these organizations are helping that client. And so my question is, do you have any recommendation how we can strengthen those linkages? Thank you so much. Over to panelists. Thank you so much for the Great questions. In terms of HIV status, so the Hey Baby cohort does have access to um, the National Health Laboratory Services. So we do link self-reported to biomarkers and we're able to identify those who have not disclosed during our self-report interviews. So the disaggregated analysis that I've presented is based on what we've also confirmed through um, review of medical records. So those who are living with HIV are also confirmed through medical records that they are indeed living with HIV. Um, economic partner violence, the WHO scale that we used did not have economic partner violence and we didn't include it specifically in terms of living together with your partner. We did ask questions if you were living with your partner, if there were economic shocks in the house um, and those do come up as predictors of IPV. We're still trying to understand how the pathway really looks like, especially when you also have food security in that same model. So we're trying to really tease that out. Um, as we develop the analysis. Um, how many of them reported to the police? Um, so we, we, we didn't ask this specifically in our questionnaire. We did ask around if they'd like to be referred, if they've told someone, but we didn't actually look at, at, at reporting at the police. I see Alona with a hand. For rape. Yeah, so for specifically for rape too, right? So that's for penetrative sex specifically. Um, Yanke, I think the rest are for you. Yeah. Screening, um, how do we ask about screening without re-traumatizing? That is a very difficult one. Um, I think it's, it, I'm not a clinician, but I like to think it comes with the fact that we need to support the ordeal and the trauma. And the only way we can do that is if we know what happened. Um, so I don't know, maybe others who do the screening can speak better to that, but we do need to know what's going on to support. Yeah, okay. um, yeah I think the question was around how to strengthen linkages. Um, I must admit that we are on the research side and not necessarily on the implementation side in our study. Um, so I'm sure other colleagues here will have great ideas, but one thing, for example, that we found in our study through our referral system um, is that um, we have a partner that offers counseling and psychosocial services um, to participants who want it. Um, and we found that the best way to do this is for the organization to actually contact the participant and not it be the other way around. Um, and so we found that identifying them through screening and then having um, the psychosocial support partner contact the participant directly um, seemed to work better in certain, in certain ways, so that's one idea. Maybe to add what Yanka is saying, the learned lesson I think from that team is invest in knowing your resources. Mm -hmm. 
you need to invest in knowing your resources. So it took us a very long time to map out what is available. It also took us a very long time to acknowledge and accept what's available is not working. So I think really taking the time to map the linkages, know if they're working, try them again and again, and then decide. Um, so invest in the time of knowing the linkages and what they actually do offer. That was the, the learned lesson from that initiative. Whoop, let's clap hands for them. So, thank you so much to the wonderful panelists. What I'm going to do and challenge is the Dr. Nadia, the Angle, the Wat Wat, the Young at Heart. You have seen what we can do, right? We are so powerful and formidable. And we are coming for you. How? Oh. <laughs> oh, yes, we are coming for you. And you know, Dr. Nadia promised us some gifts. Did you receive them? No. So, they don't. This is, ah! the this is the extra two not minutes. Now. I shouldn't have given not it to now. you. <laughs> yes, you said you're going to give us at the end of your whole session. We didn't receive anything. I know, right? Yes. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to my co facilitator. Um, thank you very much. I'm also still waiting. I hope we, we get them before we depart. But um, without wasting any time, as we have the last 50 seconds, thank God we made it on time. Um, we need, um, what, my parting word is that we need to continue addressing the needs of adolescent and young people and ensure that we listen. Mm. We listen not to speak to them, but speak with them. Um, so with that said, thank you, thank you, Tatenda, Zikomo, Asande. See you guys on the floor. So it's break time.